good morning to all of you today we are at fifth day of science leadership workshop supported by three prestigious science academies in india indian academy of sciences bangalore insa that is international science academy and nasi that is national academy of sciences allahabad and this is organized by central university of punjab so today the first talk is at 11 o'clock right now it is by professor shahid jamil a very well known renowned uh, you know the virologist and partner award winner he is with us right now after his talk 1 to 2 pm is going to be by dr smita jain uh, she is a director and founder of india bioscience portal at 3:30 pm to 4:30 pm we have professor r k kohli our vice chancellor and fellow of all the science academies in the country and at 5:30 pm to 6:30 pm we have for professor monisha dhiman from central university of punjab so stay tuned so this is our uh, the day program coming to the first speaker of the day professor shahid jamil is a renowned virologist and chief executive officer of welcome trust dbt india alliance a major funding body he has discovered molecular mechanisms of the transmission of hiv and hepatitis e viruses so several key findings in well known international prestigious journals that he made it he is an elected fellow of all three science academies in the country and winner of prestigious shanti swarup patnagar prize he holds msc from iit kanpur phd from washington state university and after that he worked for a long time with professor obaid siddiqui and he returned back and uh, he is uh, he has been working at uh, international center for genetic engineering and biotechnology in delhi for a long time before he accepted his position as a ceo of the dbt uh, you know welcome trust india alliance so uh, thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation to be part of the science leadership workshop and this session is co moderated by dr yogalakshmi nandabalan and uh, dr yogalakshmi is associate professor in department of Uh, environment sciences over to you ma'am uh thank you dr felix uh good morning everyone uh at the outset i would like to uh, welcome uh, uh, the participants as well as our uh, speaker uh from i mean uh, dr felix has uh, read to the biodata the biodata clearly shows his experience and contribution to the society and to science uh it's our privilege sir we are humbled to welcome you and uh, listen to your lecture without any further delay let's get to the lecture over to you sir thank you very much yoga lakshmi and thank you felix for the invitation uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to speak to future leaders of science in india uh, am i audible all right yes Wonderful. very clear let me uh, share my slides and then we are ready to go Okay, I believe you can see my slides, right? Yes. All right. Wonderful. So um, I uh, will tell you about my journey in science, and uh, the the title I chose is because I'm often asked uh, by students whether they can change fields, uh, and this is really to uh, show that. yes you can change fields all the time uh, but it's also important that you do well in whatever field you have chosen uh, for yourself all right uh, since i am unable to go to the viewer i'll have to somehow move my slides just give me a minute perhaps you can click the uh, right side format picture there is an arrow key just uh, close that format picture dialog box yeah and uh, right arrow key would be fine i think it should move okay does it move right arrow key for the next next no it doesn't it's not moving right uh let me just close this and come back uh, sure again sure uh, sure, sure. Just give me a minute.
Okay. Now I can't see my slides. Seems to be a little problem here. I can't see my slides. Uh, Felix, it looks like I may have to log out and log back in. Otherwise, you can just email me the slide. I will change from here. No problem. All right. I'm, I'm doing both. I'm emailing you as well as logging right. out and logging back in. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry about that, everyone. No problem. No. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, perfect. And you are able to hear me? Yes, yes, all yes, is yes. Fine. Okay, wonderful, okay. All right, so let's start from the top. So uh, I was saying that a lot of times uh, students especially ask whether they can uh, change fields. And I've chosen my title uh, to reflect that, that uh, if you look at my journey, it has gone all the way from uh, studying chemistry as an undergraduate. Uh, my PhD was essentially in plant biochemistry. And then from there I moved to medical sciences and human virology. And uh, I wanted to chart out my journey so that uh, you can see the lessons, the choices I had to make and the lessons that I possibly learned uh, from this journey. So uh, the outline of my talk, I will talk a little bit about my career trajectory. Then I will, uh, since this is a scientific audience, I would like to summarize my research done over 30 years in about eight to 10 slides. Uh, and after that, uh, I will tell you a little bit about my career change and things that I have learned along the way, and hopefully offer some advice that may be useful to some of you. All right, uh, so about me, unlike many of you listening to this, I grew up at a time when there was no Google. Uh, so we had to really to get answers, we had to read books. Uh, and it's become a lifelong habit to read books because when you read books, you also, it has other off-target effects. Uh, you improve your uh, language, uh, you learn about interesting things. But uh, it's not just that we read all the time, 
uh, people of my generation also uh, played and we played outside. We didn't just play on our laptops or on our cell phones. Uh, we didn't have cell phones. Uh, so we, we played with friends, we played outside and that developed camaraderie, that developed competition uh, and all of that. And that uh, serves you well in life. Uh, the, the friends that you make early in your life remain with you forever. And uh, that makes life interesting. I also believe uh, truly that our experiences in life define us who we are as, as a person. Uh, so, uh, for example, some of us uh, like, like to read a lot. I like to read a lot and I, I like to read all kinds of things, not just in science, but in history, travel, all kinds of things. Uh, and I truly believe that uh, we only have one life to live. Uh, we won't get another chance. So uh, we'll try and make the best use of it. All right, so when I was coming out of school, uh, I, the only thing I knew was that I would like to study science. And that also happened because uh, in school I did well and I did well in science particularly. There used to be a program called the National Science Talent Program for where you know, you were selected as you were finishing high school. Uh, 350 high school kids from across the country were selected. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be one of those. And it was a truly exciting program. We went on summer camps and really did wonders. All right, so as I was coming out of university, I knew I had to study science. One option was medicine. Uh, and I very quickly gave up the idea of uh, studying medicine. Uh, although my first year in college was uh, a pre-medical course. Uh, and finally decided that I would uh, study chemistry uh, simply because I found biology to be very descriptive. And since I didn't have math in high school, I was really scared of math and physics. So chemistry was about the only option. And uh, I grew up in, in Aligarh on the AMU campus. Uh, chemistry department was really good. Uh, so I, I thought I'll enroll there for my BSc. And uh, the thing that I remember most from my BSc is that I had really wonderful teachers. Uh, teachers who really inspired you. And I've, uh, I very fondly remember many of them and I, uh, put three of them here, people who taught us general chemistry in the first year. I can still remember the SPDF orbitals that were taught uh, uh, organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry. It was really uh, a lot of fun uh, in, in BSc. I did well in my BSc and uh, as I was coming out, uh, I then had a choice where I wanted to go and do my master's. I was always a bit bio bio-oriented. Uh, uh, so the choice was between doing a master's in chemistry or doing a master's in biochemistry. Uh, I had applied to IIT Kanpur in the chemist for chemistry. Uh, that was the only place I applied to for the chemistry program. But I had applied to a few other uh, biochemistry programs. So again, I had to make a choice. Uh, uh, where I really wanted to be. Uh, I had admission in IIT Kanpur in the chemistry program, which is really one of the best programs in the country. I also had admission in biochemistry at AMU at Hyderabad Central University, which was just starting out at that time, uh, and uh, in PGI Chandigarh. Uh, all of these were very competitive programs. And I decided very quickly that uh, AMU was out uh, simply because my father happened to be the chairman of the biochemistry department at AMU at that time. And uh, I didn't want to be doing my MSc in the department where my father was teaching. Uh, if I did well, uh, uh, everyone would think that I did well because of my father. And if I didn't do well, I would have trouble at home. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, my father also advised that, you know, you should really 
go to IIT Kanpur, it's a very good department. And if your chemistry grounding is solid, then you will have no problem getting into biochemistry. So I took his advice and went to IIT Kanpur. Uh, and it was really a wonderful program. Uh, I got to meet some really fantastic people, both my uh, co-students as well as uh, some teachers. And the two teachers that I would like to remember very fondly, uh, one was Dr. Pinaki Guptabhaya, who taught us thermodynamics. And Pinaki was always in a learning mode. He always wanted to learn something new. Uh, uh, so for example, he would sit, take us and say, you know, I don't understand Feynman's physics. And he would sit with Feynman's physics lectures. And it was essentially his way of teaching us uh, Feynman's lectures by saying that he didn't understand them. Uh, and the other was Professor uh, Subramani Ranganathan, uh, who was also the head at that time. And uh, he taught us the elective course in bioorganic chemistry. Uh, wonderful teacher, wonderful human beings. Uh, really enjoyed uh, my time there. Uh, during my uh, MSc as part of the National Science Talent uh, Program, I spent a summer uh, in Professor Ubed Siddiqui's lab at TFR uh, in Bombay. And that was really when I uh, found how much fun research can be. Uh, so that was probably that summer of 1978 was possibly the defining time for me that I would go and pursue uh, a, a PhD. Uh, while at IIT Kanpur, I was still toying with the idea of whether to do a PhD or do something else. And I had given the IIM exam and I had cleared it uh, all the way to the interviews. But interestingly, uh, the day of the interview and my final exam in Professor Ranganathan's course uh, were on the same day. And Professor Ranganathan uh, told me that uh, and if you don't take this exam, I cannot guarantee you whether you will graduate. Uh, I guess that was his way of making sure that I stayed in science. Uh, so, you know, so much for I am Ahmedabad, I stayed in science and, and, and decided to go and, and do a PhD. So now the next uh, step was uh, where to go and do a PhD. And I applied to many programs. Uh, I had admission in a couple of them. Uh, I finally decided to go to Washington State University uh, to do my PhD in biochemistry. And uh, I did my PhD in the lab of uh, Bruce McFadden, uh, who was mainly studying photosynthesis in, in plants. Uh, but he had also started a new line of work uh, looking at the biochemistry of the glyoxalate cycle, which is uh, the main shunt uh, to the Krebs cycle. Uh, and this is, a, this is a pathway that uh, organisms use, mainly lower organisms and plants use to convert uh, stored fats into carbohydrates. Uh, so I studied the enzyme, which is the rate limiting enzyme for this pathway, which is called isocitrate lyase. And I purified this enzyme mainly from germinating seeds. Uh, and I also did some work with uh, the nematode uh, C. elegans, which also uh, uses this pathway during its development. So I, I purified during my PhD, I purified the enzyme. I did a lot of kinetic studies on the enzyme. Uh, remember this was a time uh, when there was no site directed mutagenesis. Uh, it had not been discovered. So essentially to study the active site of the enzyme, we did a lot of chemical modifications. And that's really where my chemistry uh, background helped uh, because uh, you know, together with the postdoc in the lab who was an organic chemist, we synthesized some, uh, uh, some inhibitors, uh, some active site inhibitors and used those to uh, study uh, the active site of the enzyme. So uh, Washington State was a very nice experience. Uh, uh, small, uh, uh, not a small university, about 25,000 students, but uh, in a small town, a uh, lot of uh, very good sports opportunities. And I was very much into, into tennis at that time. So I really enjoyed my time uh, at Washington State.
So the next choice I had to make uh, is what do I do after finishing my PhD? I wanted to do a postdoc, but I really was veering more towards molecular biology and more towards uh, human disease. And I figured that I should really go and learn molecular biology uh, because till that time I had not done any, I had done classical biochemistry and, and chemistry. Uh, so 1984, you know, early eighties was also a time which was very exciting for genetic engineering and molecular biology. Uh, and what I realized at that time was that viruses were becoming rather interesting tools to understand the molecular basis of infectious disease, as also to understand, uh, you know, cellular functions. Uh, and when you look back at uh, what happened in the 70s and 80s, in terms of the highest levels of research and innovation, you find that, uh, you know, for example, many Nobel prizes in that, in those decades were given to people who studied viruses, uh, but towards a larger goal, all the way from, uh, you know, the discovery of reverse transcriptase by Tem in Baltimore and uh, uh, cell culture by uh, Del Beco, uh, hepatitis B virus uh, really was the one that came out uh, and it's, it's, it was the first virus uh, genome, essentially human virus genome to be sequenced. Restriction enzymes were discovered. Uh, recombinant DNA was made. DNA sequencing became available. Monoclonal antibodies, uh, you know, molecular basis for uh, heart disease, tumor viruses, a lot of uh, very, very important discoveries were made uh, uh, with, uh, you know, in molecular biology and especially with viruses. So I guess uh, my career choice was made that I wanted to study the molecular basis of human uh, infectious disease. And I wanted to learn molecular biology in that process. Uh, and I had to go and do a postdoc somewhere. The choices I had for a postdoc, uh, uh, I had, narrowed it down to two labs. One was a very well-known uh, immunology lab in the US. And the other was a lab which was a very new lab. They were studying uh, the hepatitis B virus. The uh, PI was uh, only there for a year, young PI, and I was going to be his first postdoc. Uh, in the immunology lab, I would be going to a big lab with many postdocs. Uh, so I guess uh, that was an important career choice to make. And I decided to pursue a career in virology and go to the lab where uh, I would be the first postdoc hired in the lab. Uh, and my career choice was rather simple. Uh, I, I went and did a postdoc at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center uh, and my mentor there was uh, Alim Siddiqui, who was just a few years older than me. Uh, he was a young assistant professor. Uh, this was his first uh, faculty position. He had a very strong lineage coming from uh, the labs of Bill Robinson and Paul Berg uh, at Stanford. Uh, and he had provided the first sequence of the hepatitis B virus. Uh, I, this, this was a very good uh, uh, choice to make for me because I was learning all my molecular biology from somebody who had directly done this and who was at the forefront of uh, it being developed. Uh, and Alim was a very, very good mentor. He gave me a lot of freedom in the lab. He taught me on the bench and he really let me learn uh, by exploring, by making mistakes. Uh, and uh, that was really wonderful. The important thing is that, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, about four decades later, uh, we are still friends and we still talk to each other. We discuss a lot of science, but we also discuss a lot of history and music and 
all kinds of things. Uh, it was a it was a very very nice lab to be in, and the two pictures I have put are sort of illustrative of that. It was a fairly happy environment in the lab. We worked hard and we also played hard. We went on a lot of hikes. We went on skiing trips. You know, all kinds of things. Uh, and the other thing you would notice is that I did a fairly short postdoc. I did a postdoc for only three years. Uh, at, at that time, people didn't really do more than five years of postdoc, unlike today when I see people spending, you know, sometimes eight to 10 years doing postdocs. Beyond a time, you stop learning in your postdoc and you simply become a highly paid technician. Uh, so you really need to be developing your own ideas and uh, develop those ideas. So around 87, uh, I, you know, I had uh, done well. Uh, so I was starting to look for positions. Uh, but let me go back a little and tell you why viral hepatitis and what I really did. So viral hepatitis, as some of you may know, uh, is caused by five different viruses. Uh, the serum hepatitis or hepatitis, which is transmitted through blood, can be caused by three different agents. Hepatitis B virus was the first to be discovered and later Hep C was discovered. Uh, on the other hand, infectious hepatitis, uh, the enteric hepatitis, uh, is caused by the Hep A virus and the Hep B e virus. So I did my postdoc on the Hep B virus, and when my, I set up my own lab, I started working on hepatitis E. But that's a different story, uh, and I'll come to that. But before that, uh, when I started working on viral hepatitis, this sort of table was in front of me that if you look at disease around the world, these viruses cause a lot of disease uh, around the world. Uh, and the, the maps on the right tells you why a virus like hepatitis B is important. Uh, if you look at that map, you will see that the world global prevalence of hepatitis B carriers and the annual incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer, their maps almost overlap, suggesting that Hepatitis B is a major cause of primary hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, so that was really the driving force for us to be uh, studying this virus. Well, I study, started studying this virus fairly early in the, the, the understanding of the virus. And in my postdoc, I basically looked at the transcription control elements and how the viral genome is transcribed. Uh, it's a partially double-stranded uh, DNA genome, very small genome, only 3.2 kilobase. It's coded for four different proteins. So uh, in the three years of my postdoc, I really characterized the promoters and the viral enhancer in, in the viral genome. And uh, in that process, I in the three years, I published uh, four or five papers. Uh, three of them I, I show you here. Uh, so at that time, I was really thinking that now I'm ready to be setting up my own lab and, and starting uh, to do things on my own. And, and Alim supported that very much and uh, wanted me to go out and explore. So I, I interviewed with a few biotech companies in, in US and it didn't work out. At the same time, I had also uh, applied to other places. So uh, I'm showing you this map because you know I was at that time sort of here in Denver, Colorado, and I always wanted to come back to India to set up uh, my own lab. Uh, and I started applying around 87, uh, but in 87, I also got a position at the Institute for Molecular and Cell Biology at the National University of Singapore. Uh, I almost went there, but then at the last minute decided that no, my goal is really to get here uh, and I don't want to be uh, stuck in Singapore. And I figured it would be hard for me to go to India, to be hired in India from Singapore 
than if I was continuing with what I doing in, in the US. Uh, so I continued there. I was appointed an assistant professor in 87 in the Department of Medicine. Uh, and I was setting up a lab to do molecular biology in the division of rheumatology while I was working on recombinant uh, interleukin-1 uh, beta. Uh, in 1988, uh, I had also applied to ICGB in 87. Uh, ICGB was just coming up as a new center in, in India. Uh, and I got an offer uh, in 88, uh, around, uh, you know, early 88, I got uh, an appointment at ICGB. Uh, and I decided to move. Uh, the primary reason for me to move, uh, the context is this, you know, I had an assistant professor position. It was a tenure track position. I had a green card. Uh, I had things, I was publishing well, I had things going for me. Uh, but I decided that if I don't go to India now, I will probably never go. Uh, I had family obligations back home and I really wanted to get here. Uh, the other plus points was that ICGB was a new institution and I was going to be the first one in the virology program. So I would essentially be setting up the virology program. And, you know, I think that's the best decision I made. Uh, because at that time I was 31 years old and at the age of 31, you don't often get chances to set up a program. And I, this was the top thing in my mind that, you know, a green card, a faculty position in US, I will only be making incremental changes. Uh, if I really wanted to achieve something big, I have to go and set up a program and set it up uh, based on my vision of how things should be. So we came back and uh, set up a program at ICGB and I stayed at ICGB for the next 25 years uh, from 1988 till 2015. At ICGB, I uh, started a program on hepatitis E. And again here, I think the importance of mentors is so good, is so useful. Uh, when I was moving back to India, I asked Aleem, uh, what do you think I should be working on? I've been working here on hepatitis B. I have ideas of things to do in hepatitis B. And he said, well, I mean, if you want to continue working on hepatitis B, that's fine. Uh, you have access to all the reagents from the lab. You can take anything you want and we'll help you. But he also said that, you know, the big issues in hepatitis B have sort of been addressed. You will be filling little holes here and there. You'll be filling some gaps. However, there is this new disease that was discovered in India. We don't know much about it. It appears to be a viral disease. So why don't you start working on that? Uh, and it was at that time called the non-A, non-B hepatitis. It wasn't even called hepatitis E. The virus was finally discovered and sequenced only in uh, 1990. So I came up and set up my lab uh, in 88 and started working with this. I got in touch with clinicians, both in the Kashmir Valley where the virus, uh, where the disease was first discovered, as well as people at PGI Chandigarh, at uh, SGPGI Lucknow, at Ames, Delhi. I was really collaborating with a lot of clinicians uh, trying to clone the sequence, uh, the, the, the genome of uh, hepatitis E virus. So that's the background of the disease. It's, a, it's a, an epidemic and uh, sporadic form of viral hepatitis, uh, really a problem in developing countries uh, such as ours. About 3 billion people are estimated to be living in areas endemic for hepatitis E. Uh, there is fecal oral transmission, waterborne outbreaks happen. Uh, there is acute infection, which can sometimes develop into fulminant liver disease. Uh, the population mortality is, is about 1%, but it can be fatal in pregnant women. 
so these were many outstanding issues in in the study of this virus that i uh, started looking at uh, fairly early so we did a lot of virus transmission studies we did a lot of cloning work we developed uh, a pcr test and using this pcr test uh, we did some really interesting clinical studies uh, which uh, we published in the top ranking clinical journals uh, like lancet uh, so you know the point is that you know i i was really collaborating quite quite a lot and i was collaborating with clinicians at a time when there was very little collaboration between basic scientists and clinicians uh, that has its has its own uh, uh, you know that has its own learnings so we finally cloned the viral genome we were not the first ones to clone the viral genome uh, a biotech company in us did it uh, before us but nevertheless we cloned the viral genome of uh, from an isolate in uh, that we collected from hyderabad uh, and i really my lab spent uh, the next 20 years trying to understand what viral proteins do uh, in the case of hepatitis e and how are they involved in disease causation in in pathogenesis so that's the hepatitis e virus fairly simple virus uh, a 7.2 kilo base uh, single stranded positive sense rna uh, codes for three proteins uh, and we basically cloned these proteins and characterized uh, these proteins try to understand their function in uh, in cells Uh, that was also a time when cell signaling was becoming very uh, very hot area to be in uh, and we were possibly one of the first groups to start exploring how viral proteins uh, interject signaling pathways of cells and uh, we did a lot of work on uh, especially the orf3 protein which is a regulatory protein on how it controlled multiple signaling pathways in cells so i don't want to bore you with a lot of details uh, but uh, just some salient things that came out of my lab on hepatitis c uh, if you look at the viral life cycle the virus first binds to some attachment factors uh, on the cell surface and following this it binds to the cellular receptor uh, so uh, manjula who was a senior postdoc in my lab at icbb showed that heparin sulfate proteoglycans uh, act as viral attachment factors and uh, later uh, prasida a phd student showed uh, the you know she characterized the early events in the entry of uh, the virus into cells and prasida and another postdoc also characterized the first receptor uh, for the virus uh, on on cells Uh, we spent a majority of our effort looking at the viral proteins that are being made and how these viral proteins uh, affect uh, the host cell so that's really broadly what my lab did uh, for about uh, 20 odd years we also tried our hands on a recombinant uh, dual vaccine uh, and uh, we took a clue from the hepatitis uh, b virus the hepatitis b virus if you express the surface protein in in yeast it naturally forms particles these are called 22 nanometer particles now these particles can be used to display other epitopes and by that time we knew that on the surface of the hepatitis b virus this blue region that you see is the sort of neutralizing domain in the surface protein so we tag this uh, surface pro this this neutralizing domain on to the hepatitis b virus and created a particle that had hepatitis b uh, surface protein but tagged on to it is uh, are the neutralizing epitopes of uh, of of hepatitis e so essentially you know at, we we could do only up to a mouse model uh, and we found that using this you could get antibodies to both the hepatitis b and e parts so essentially this could potentially act as a as a dual vaccine uh but you know that we we faced a lot of difficulty with this because 
uh, we were not equipped to do things beyond a mouse system. And when you start talking to biotech companies about taking this further, developing it further, the thing on their mind is how much money will it make me? Uh, and hepatitis E is a poor man's disease. You have to make a vaccine that is very, very cheap. And uh, I spent a lot of time talking to biotech companies, both in India and overseas. And unfortunately, this vaccine never saw the light of the day. Uh, I mean, you, you get some, you don't get others. So it doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, so the other virus I worked on was, uh, was HIV. And we started a program on HIV in the mid 90s. And that was also a time when HIV infection in India was becoming a problem. So I will simply summarize about uh, you know, 15 to 20 years of work in this one slide. Uh, so we basically worked on two different proteins. Uh, one is called the NEF protein and the other is called the VPU protein. These are both accessory proteins which are not required for viral infection in cell culture but they are absolutely required for virus infection in, uh, uh, in, in humans. Uh, and there's, there was plenty of evidence for that. Uh, so we did a lot of work with these two proteins and some of the work that we have published, for example, is listed here. Uh, we were actually the first lab in India to show that uh, the clade C of the virus dominates in India. Uh, and this is work we did in partnership with uh, people at PGI Chandigarh. Uh, we uh, worked on a lot of patient isolates, characterized viral proteins from patient isolates, and addressed various other things such as innate immunity, co-stimulatory pathways, uh, how RNAi pathways are affected by uh, these viral proteins. And towards the later part of my time at ICGB, we really got into exosomes and uh, micro RNAs and long non-coding RNAs, uh, and also how HIV affects hepatic fibrosis, uh, which uh, seemed to be a big problem in, in HIV patients. Uh, all this work is published, so therefore I'm not going to any of these details. But the towards the end of my time at ICGB, I really found exosomes to be very, very interesting area to, to work in, because exosomes simply are vesicles that are thrown out by every cell uh, and they are taken up by other cells. So it's, it's a sort of a way of communication between one cell or, and the other cell. Our interest in exosomes was from uh, the perspective of HIV and the problem that we wanted to address and we also addressed it to, to some extent is how an HIV infected cell alters the metabolism of an uninfected cell? And how does it prepare an uninfected cell to become infected? Uh, so that was really what, what we were studying. And along those lines, we looked at micro RNA pathways, long non-coding RNA pathways, because uh, exosomes also carry uh, uh, a lot of uh, RNA uh, in them. So anyway, all that is published. I'm not going to go beyond this, uh, around 2013, uh, I made a career change. Uh, so I went from a, a research scientist who was always begging for funds uh, to a situation where I would be running a funding agency. Uh, and this was quite a transition. Uh, and I, again, I came to a point where I had to make a choice. Uh, and I will tell you why I made this choice. Uh, so around 2013, uh, my funding was good. Uh, I, I had no problem with that, but I, I was a little uneasy with myself because I didn't think I had as many good ideas at that point as I had earlier in my career to take me on for another 10 years. Uh, so the choice was, should I continue to do something uh, where I knew honestly that I don't have good ideas 
or try and apply myself to another situation where uh, you know i could make a real change i have always been interested in in supporting young people in mentoring uh, in providing opportunities to younger people and i had many people who went through my lab uh, and you know i'm still connected to them uh, you know in one way or the other so i figured that if i move to a funding agency like india alliance i'll have a lot of opportunity to interact with some really smart people and learn from them and also uh, you know help uh, sort of support them so uh, i had applied for this position and when i uh, i was offered uh, this position i decided i will take it uh, and i also decided that uh, slowly i'm going to wind down my research i'll close my lab i'm not going to be uh, having my uh, feet in two different boats and and i think that's very important uh, for us to understand Uh, i guess i'm trying to convey two things from my experience one is that you really need to be honest with yourself nobody is going to tell you whether you know you are good at doing something or not or or otherwise you are your best judge be honest with yourself and if you think you're going to make a difference somewhere go for it But don't worry about leaving something behind which you think you're not going to be making as much of a difference as you do uh and the other thing is uh, be clear in your mind as to what you're doing have clarity of thought uh don't be confused about doing both this and that usually doesn't work like that people who have their feet in too many boards uh simply drown themselves they don't do very much beyond that so so that's what i did i slowly closed down my lab because i still had students and postdocs in the lab and they had to finish their work and go away so over a period of about 2 years i closed my lab uh, at it all right so i'll tell you a little bit about my current job <clears throat> i currently manage a team of about 35 people Uh, and these people are divided across uh, teams like uh, we have a grants team we have a finance team we have uh, we have a hr and operations team an it team you know a communications team a very important part of any organization and we manage a portfolio of about uh, 200 crores per year uh, we are funded by both dbt uh, from government of india and the welcome trust which is a large british charity so when i joined this uh, my goal was to really develop an efficient fair and transparent system that would select and support the best biomedical researchers in india that's all our, that's all that matters to us uh, we want to select the best people who will do very high quality biomedical science in india and we cannot do that unless we are absolutely fair and transparent so all decisions are made by external committees uh, which are populated by really really good people uh, international leaders in, in their own fields our aim is not just to give some funding to people our aim is to really develop the next generation of science leaders for india and there is a difference in those you can you can you know be a very good scientist and publish in very high impact journals uh, but how do you become a science leader how do you become somebody whose voice is heard uh, and we give a lot of emphasis on soft skill development and i i feel that the this workshop for example is also trying to convey that to people who are who are attending that soft skills become very important as you move up the ladder uh, and the sooner you start developing your soft skills the better the pros and cons of my job is that i really love meeting and learning from uh, the best and brightest uh, and this could be applicants this could be our fellows our committee members uh, the the flip side of of this job is that 
until coronavirus hit us, I was traveling like crazy. I was, you know, sort of like traveling about two weeks in a month, uh, both international and national travel. And, you know, it gets to you. But nevertheless, uh, we were doing exciting things and I, I really didn't mind that. Uh, the program is doing very well and it has, it has really uh, developed into quite an impactful program. And that's not, that's not my opinion. We go through external reviews and that's really the, the, the opinion of reviewers. All right, uh, so let me say a few other things about science. And the first is, uh, the scheme of doing things in science, the schema of science. You know, when you are a young PhD student, you are out to change the world. You get into research thinking that every experiment will, you do will lead to a new discovery. You also feel that your experiments are going to be so straightforward that you start at point A and you will reach point B. The reality of life is unfortunately dif different. Uh, the reality is that you will start at point A, you will, trying to get to point B, you lose your way. You'll find a lot of other things. And eventually you may not even get to B, but you may get to another point C. So the point is you're, you have to be you have to train your mind and be prepared to even see if you're getting to point C, which is also providing useful information. Uh, you, you can't take this as, as sort of a failed experiment because you wanted to get to B and you didn't get to B. But you got somewhere else and you know that point may be even more exciting uh, compared to where you wanted to be. So I guess what I'm telling you is keep your mind open, look at data and look at evidence. Let data and evidence drive your conclusions instead of having a preconceived conclusion and trying to fit your data to that conclusion. I think that's very, very important for researchers to, to understand and also to train your mind so that when you see something different, you're able to spot it and make use of that opportunity. Uh, along the way, as I was training PhD students, I had a few uh, rules for my PhD students. Uh, and I'm putting these up for, for you to see. And these I call the 10 commandments for PhD students. Uh, these are, of course, inspired by a writer uh, in nature many, many years back. So the first point is that as a PhD student, it is really your thesis and therefore you will have to do it. Nobody else will have the energy or the interest to do it. Your thesis, you do it. Also that, you know, if you're getting into a PhD, it's really going to be hard work. It's going to be long days and long nights. Uh, and so your vacation really begins after you have defended your thesis. Uh, the point really is that you have to work really hard. What also matters in science is what is right. It doesn't matter whether I am the supervisor or I am the professor or the head of the department, it doesn't matter. Uh, what is right is what is right. If you think that you are right, you have to convince me that you're right. And I'll be happy to be convinced. Uh, but till you convince me that you're right, uh, I also have uh, a right to defend my point of view. So that's how science moves forward. Remember always that science is a culture of questioning. Science is a culture of doubt. And that is where, that is the fundamental difference between science and religion. Science is based on doubt. Religion is based on belief. This has to be very clear to all of us. You have to question in science. If you don't question, if you accept things without questioning, you're not being a scientist. Uh, also your productivity in the lab is 
almost always directly proportional to the effective productive time you spend in the lab. And I use the word effective productive time. I'm not using the word time. You may be spending all night in the lab, but not do anything. And I honestly, I have never been impressed by people who say that, you know, I worked all night in the lab. My next question to them is, what did you do? And I've had people go through my lab who had this habit of, you know, working all night. And in the morning, I will figure out that they were really not as productive as somebody who had planned their time really well and spent only about eight to 10 hours in the lab during the day. So planning is very important when you are working. So that's why effective productive time. Don't impress me by saying you spent so many hours or overnight in the lab. I would not be impressed. I would be impressed to see what you've done. Also, there is something funny about equipment. It usually breaks down uh, when you are going to take, uh, do your experiment. So make sure you take your data uh, quickly uh, before that equipment decides to break down. And always make a copy of your data because if you don't, uh, you will, your computer will crash and you will lose data. And it has happened to every one of us. So make that a habit. For a PhD student, the productivity is usually low. Uh, and we understand that as supervisors, but we also expect it to get better with time. Uh, it's, it's really interesting that the same experiment which fails in the hands of a first year PhD student usually works in the hands of a second or third year PhD student. Same reagent, same lab. The only thing different is that a third year student has already made those mistakes and has subconsciously learned not to make those mistakes. So we expect this to happen, uh, but slowly increase your productivity as time goes on. And eventually the, the idea is for you to become a bigger expert in your thesis area than your supervisor. If you're not doing that, then you, you know, you're not doing a good PhD. And another aspect of doing a good PhD is not to publish, I mean, you may publish big papers, you may publish a lot of papers, but what is really important is, have you learned to question? Have you learned to analyze? Have you learned to read a paper and find out what might be the problem with this paper? What would be the next experiment that should be done? So analytical ability uh, is very, very important to develop during your PhD. And finally, I would be very happy if, if, if my student becomes a bigger expert in, and becomes famous because that's about the only way uh, a supervisor wants to become famous. Okay, uh, let me also say something about grants and papers. And I see a lot of it in my, in my current job. I think it's very important to keep things logical and keep things simple. There is so much jargon in science, especially in biology, and jargon impresses no one. People who review your papers and grants, especially grants, are usually people who know something about the area, but they may not be the biggest experts in the area. So therefore, keep your jargon to the minimum. Don't think that everyone will understand it. Uh, and what you are writing has to be absolutely clear. Usually, if you are asked to come and defend uh, a grant, you're given at best 10 minutes to defend a grant. And if you have not been able to really defend your point of view in a 10 page application, you're surely not going to be able to defend in a 10 minute presentation. So develop good uh, writing skills and develop good presentation skills so that you can come to the point very, very quickly. Uh, we all hate reviewers. We think, each of us thinks that reviewers are bad. They are bad people, they are after us, but actually reviewers are not bad people. They simply want good people in the field. They want good people in the community. They want work to be done well. Uh, convince them that you have done the work well, you are good for the community and you will find uh, that you know, 
things are easier for you. And the third point is about criticism of your work. Uh, make sure that you give your papers and your grants to others to read and have the ability to criticize you. Take criticism positively. Criticism is like sandpaper. Uh, it shines you. Uh, so don't, don't shy away from, from taking criticism. It's, it's very, very important to learn from it. Uh, how to say, stay scientifically young. And, and, and this is really inspired by uh, uh, a very famous American comedian called George Carlin, who died uh, about 10 years back. Uh, and, you know, he used to be really funny uh, and I sort of grown up listening to him. Uh, so my principles of staying scientifically young are sort of inspired by him. Well, he used to say that you should surround yourself with smart people. I think that's very good advice. Uh, and generally surround yourself with younger people. Uh, they're more smarter than, than older people. They have fewer inhibitions than, than older. Uh, keep learning all your life. Uh, and you know, you should really be attacking new problems every you know, so many years. And this is something that I did in my own career. I tried to attack a new problem every five to seven years. This was my way to get out of my comfort zone, to read in a new area, to, to really get ideas from, from other fields. Uh, the other is for all of us who go to meetings, you know, go to meetings to learn, uh, not to show off some hard data that you have and then, you know, your talk is done, your poster is done, you're out of the meeting. Uh, don't do that. Go to meetings to learn uh, and to make contacts. Uh, science is a, is, a, is a very collegial uh, business. Uh, use meetings to, to know people, to, uh, you know, when you may meet somebody face to face, uh, it brings in uh, a, a very different kind of uh, kind of arrangement next time your grant or your paper goes to them. Uh, also, read widely and uh, read papers outside your immediate area. That's that's so important. If your best ideas are going to come from other fields. They're unlikely to come from your own field. So read widely. Uh, don't take life too seriously. Laugh often. Uh, mostly at yourself, uh, there will always be tears. And the tears to a scientist comes in terms of failed experiments, rejection of papers, grants. These happen. These happen to the best of us. Just endure that, learn from it, and move on. Don't uh, you know, get on guilt, go on guilt trips. And most importantly, you know, cherish your health. Uh, because if you're healthy, if you're thinking well, you are going to be uh, productive. Uh, finally, uh, since this is a leadership workshop, I thought I should say something about uh, leaders. Uh, so leaders of the future really must think globally. You may be acting locally, but you must have a global uh, perspective in mind. Also meet and understand different kinds of people. You must have cross-cultural appreciation. Knowing what is good or considered good or not considered good in any other culture helps you in many ways. To understand people, to build contacts, it's, it's very, very important. Uh, also today, you cannot uh, be tech naive. You have to be technologically savvy. Uh, it, it, it really helps uh, with the kind of uh, technology that has come into research today. And very importantly, you must build alliances and partnerships. Alliances and partnerships will decide how successful you are in the days to come. So I feel that if you want to become a leader, you really must follow your intellectual curiosity. You pay attention to good writing. That's very, very important. If you're not able to communicate well, you will not be able to write good grants. You will not write good papers. You will not put your uh, you will not put your point of view across. So invest some time in yourself to learn how to write and to speak well. 
uh, also learn to work in teams. Uh, pick up any big paper, any challenging problem today, it requires inputs from various kinds of people. And therefore teams are becoming far more important. And finally, I would say cultivate unfamiliar ideas. Uh, it is really unfamiliar ideas that are going to take you forward. Uh, what is very familiar to others, you are not going to make your mark on it. So let me end by simply asking you, why do you think I'm giving this talk? Uh, I, I'm definitely not smarter than any of you. But I think in my career, I have done things a bit differently than most people. The career choices I have made uh, I've always had clarity of thought and I have not been confused whether I should do this or that. Once I've decided to do something, I go full steam after it. So I, have, I do realize I've done things a little differently. Uh, you assess yourself how you want to do things and do what you find to be most comfortable. And I've always liked this line, these lines by Robert Frost because that's sort of summarizes my own career and, and, and my own professional life uh, that, you know, if you take the road less traveled, uh, you are likely to make uh, a better impact than if you traveled the same road that everyone else has traveled. So I am going to stop there and uh, stop sharing my screen. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, it was actually um, enlightening and uh, uh, very uh, impressive. It was a pleasure and we are fortunate to hear uh, you. And uh, you have beautifully um, outlined or charted out your journey from a plant biochemist to virology and from AMU to IIT Kanpur and then uh, 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 I mean Washington State University, Colorado University. And you've also affirmed the role of a good teacher and mentors in tuning your uh, career path. And uh, you also uh, uh, said like how your mentor actually uh, suggested you to take over hepatitis E and then how you excelled in that and then how you contributed to the society. It was actually a major contribution. And how you started working with HIV and then how uh, your contribution on basically the exosomes and then proteins of HIV was actually uh, uh, astounding and uh, further I mean uh, you uh, like the two mantras which you told like being honest and having clarity of thoughts that was actually very impressive and uh, I think which we have to uh, learn and uh, keep it as our own mantras also and uh, then uh, your uh, your uh, the way of looking like uh, how to I mean the way of looking and how still you are in a phase of learning and you're uh, trying to learn more from the young minds and that is why you took a career in Indian Alliance that is also very interesting and uh, very motivating and uh, finally the 10 commandments uh, that uh, you gave for the PhD students I think I will do I'll, I'll uh, take a print out of this and then I'll paste it and then I'll share it with my research scholars and then uh, I'll tell them like, this is actually good. You have to keep following it. And uh, then also you said like how to endure with your failures and how to stay scientifically young. Then being a leader, you have to have an effective communication and always follow a intellectual curiosity. That was also very good. And one important thing, uh, I, mean, I mean, one important thing is like, you have to choose a path which is less traveled. That is the main thing which most of the young scientists and uh, leaders uh, need today. Thank you so much, Professor. It was actually um, enlightening. Uh, no words to say. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take on with uh, some questions, sir. Sure, sure. Uh, there's a question uh, from Krishna Kumar. Uh, how changing research areas or fields of interest benefit in science? As, uh, for an individual, how difficult is it, or what qualities can one improve to achieve in professional life? Well, uh, I think changing fields is becoming more difficult now than it used to be when I was a 
student uh, when I was in the early stages of my career. But it is certainly doable. Uh, I think what is important is how passionate you are about following something different, how much time and energy you are willing to spend on coming out of your comfort zone and trying to learn something different. Uh, it really depends on your own drive. Uh, but you know, what people see is if you are changing fields, how you have done in what you did earlier. That's a good indicator of how you might do in the days to come. So therefore, whatever field you're in, whatever you're doing, uh, do it well. Uh, if, if I was doing plant biology today, uh, I would put all my energy into it and, and do it really well. Uh, and that's what I did in my PhD. Uh, I, I, was, I was doing enzymology uh, uh, using plants as a system. And I never thought for a minute that this is an uninteresting system. I, my, my interests were more towards uh, disease biology, but I did it with, with full energy and full interest uh, and then moved on because you have to show a good track record. Otherwise, nobody is going to hire you, right? Uh, so my advice is whatever you're doing, do it well. And if you keep doing that, newer areas will open up for you. Thank you. Brilliant. Professor. Yes, brilliant, Professor Jamil. It was absolutely fabulous. One of the best talks I ever heard, not just in this uh, in my life. Was, I can I have no words to say. About doubt versus belief, the you know how the, the religion versus doubt as a center in the sciences, and a very important point which about is you can you know if you are convinced that you could make a difference, go for that. I think that's a very key message that you relayed, and of course that relate with the frost line, the road less traveled by, and another important message you convey is that let data speaks not any for all of the uh, young researchers. So, you know, that is an amazing uh, thought. And of course, 10 commandment, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Yoga Lakshmi, it is amazing. I'm going to share with my students too. And let criticism be a sandpaper. Oh, what a profound thought is that. So uh, it's, a, it's I think that alone shows up what the spirit of the scientific method, you know, the, the feedback loops and yeah, criticism for the self-improvement that, that that I think that can even go beyond sciences, even management, uh, the, you know, the, 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 as a sandpaper. And jargon impresses no one. This is amazing concept. And, uh, you know, many students have this problem uh, using the jargon just to impress the people. You know, that is amazing thought. And read papers outside your area, which uh, I still remember a quote by DRC Thompson, the famous uh, you know, the morphologist in, in which he said that um, the fertile fields of scientific discovery is in those fields uh, where one area is, uh, you know, uh, interlapping with another area. So something like that. I, I don't actually remember the quote, but your quote is absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk, sir. Now mm -hmm. going to the questions. Uh, I would like to take one question here from Sratha from Mangalore is asking, sir, I'm an early career researcher working on viruses. Despite my best efforts and even pilot studies that got published in quality journals, early career grant application was unsuccessful. How to improve my chance of getting accepted? I'm from a less known institute. Perhaps that might have contributed in the decision. Yes. Well, uh, since I don't know the exact case, I, I would not discuss the exact case. But uh, let me tell you that uh, when at least when we evaluate applications, we do not pay attention to somebody coming from a less known institute or a more known institute. What we look at is your career trajectory, how you have published, uh, what you are writing in your proposal, how clear is, is, your, is, is your proposal, do you have you know, good grantsmanship skills? Uh, because remember, it's not just about funding uh, a researcher. It's 
it's about developing the next generation of leaders. So uh, we all, we're looking for people who are not doing just good science, but who also have uh, a natural good way of expressing themselves. And we have a lot of resources that we make publicly available. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't see these resources. On our website, we have videos on how to write a good grant. We have videos on how to face interview committees, uh, all of that. Uh, and my, my request to all early career researchers, even to you know, mid-career and senior researchers is to make use of these resources. They can be very useful in pointing you in the right direction. Uh, so uh, to, uh, my advice to you would be, you know, work hard, continue to publish well, don't worry about uh, less known institution or better known institution. Uh, show that you are productive and you are interested in developing your career. Uh, but fellowship committees really are impressed by are people who are passionate about a field of research and who are passionate about developing their own careers. Uh, so pay attention to this. Uh, uh, sir, a lot of part participants have asked this question. What are the major problems you faced while changing your subject from chemistry to virology? And how did you overcome them? Actually, to be, to be honest, uh, I didn't really face much problem because uh, I went through a PhD in biochemistry. And the good thing about PhD in US is that for the first two years, you're taking courses. Uh, so you take up courses in areas that you have never done earlier. And I can, I can tell you what happened to me. Uh, you know, when I went to uh, do my PhD, in my very first semester, I was given the job of teaching a biochemistry lab. Remember, I had never done biochemistry. I had never done a single lab in biochemistry. And here, you know, the department gave me the responsibility of, along with another student, to be the teaching assistant in the biochemistry lab. And I think they did it on purpose. They wanted me to learn some biochemistry in the lab. So the two of us used to make the reagents, do the experiment ourselves, and only then we could demonstrate the experiment to the class. So I actually learned all my biochemistry as a teaching assistant. Uh, so, you know, these are opportunities that can often come in your way and you must grab them by both hands. Uh, so honestly, I didn't really feel uh, I had any difficulty. Uh, I guess I was always more chemically oriented than my other batchmates who were more biologically oriented. But, you know, over time, I, I, I sort of overcame that. You just have to work hard, harder than most people uh, if you are changing fields. Here is one question from Abhidha from Srinagar. Fake news and conspiracy theories about COVID-19 is spreading alarmingly, and the disease spread is largely responsible for this. Does India Alliance has any program to support science communication in health sector, for example, science communication specific grants or other schemes? Yeah, so we actually, thank you for asking this question. Uh, you know, we do a lot of work in science communication. Uh, please go to our website and see everything that we do on science communication. In fact, I can say that for COVID, uh, we have a COVID resource hub on our website where we have infographics that tell you the right information on COVID. Uh, we have five infographics that give you the right information in very simple language. And uh, all of these have been translated into multiple Indian languages. Uh, about 10 or 12 Indian languages, these are all, and these are all freely available. So please go ahead and use that. We have by now done eight webinars on COVID, various aspects of it. Uh, the webinar videos are all available on our website to go and look at. 
many of us have been very active in writing in the me in the media uh, i must have written about uh, two dozen articles by now in in various uh, uh, you know media channels uh, and similarly our fellows are writing all these are also available in the resource hub uh, as far as training people in in communications yes we do have workshops we do have science communication workshops uh, and uh, these are openly advertised you can go to our website and see that uh, these days of course everything is shut down but we are continuing with online workshops uh, in fact on 29th itself we have a workshop on scientific writing and research ethics uh, so yes you know please follow our website and you will see that we do a lot of stuff uh, in 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 this area uh, dr yogarakshmi i think we are already over short so you can take up the last question because it's already 12 20 now yes okay okay sir so um yeah student reka she has asked like what is the repurposed use of bcg vaccine for reducing the impact of covid infections in pa patients what is the future uh, impact of vlp technology in vaccine development okay so uh, two things you're asking one is uh, whether bcg can work as a preventive uh, well we don't know for sure uh, there are clinical trials that are happening as of now there's a large trial happening uh, in australia and there are some other trials happening in europe and us also which will hopefully inform us possibly one way bcg helps and uh, you know the other day i was even reading that oral polio vaccine may also have some short term effects uh, and you know these effects are simply to prime the innate immune system uh, and innate immune system as you know is non specific so if the innate immune system is primed it will uh, it will inhibit Uh, the coronavirus as well as it inhibits the flu virus for example so uh, the the polio vaccine story is actually very interesting when the oral polio vaccine was developed by albert sabin in the 1950s uh, us had already started vaccinating people with the injectable polio vaccine so there were no takers in the us as a result sabin gave this vaccine to some colleagues in russia and this uh, husband and wife virologists team in russia gave the oral polio vaccine to their children uh and they noticed that the children did not get as much flu when they got the polio vaccine compared to when they didn't get the polio vaccine so you know this dates back to the 1950s that all you know vaccines especially the uh, live attenuated vaccines can really prime your innate immune system and that's why that's how it might be able to protect bcg we don't know yet uh, there are trials going on uh, it's possible that bcg offers some level of protection but data coming out of uk uh, does not suggest that because uk stopped bcg vaccination only around 2000 so they still have people who have been given bcg vaccination versus people who don't get bcg vaccination and they did not find any difference in these two populations in terms of uh, protection from infection or disease okay so the jury is still out on bcg it may help but it may not uh, as far as vlp technology vlps are good uh in any manner because vlps present, are presented much better to the immune system compared to a soluble antigen the immune presentation is much better so vlps will always uh, hold promise uh, and i think it's really time that india as a country develops platforms which will help us in any future diseases uh, we should have platforms for vlps we should have platforms for uh, uh, you know viral uh, vectors uh, so on and so forth i mean why did moderna for example 
how did it bring out a vaccine in 63 days? From the time the sequence was available to human trials, it took them only 63 days. It happened because they already had a platform and all they had to do was to take, make the RNA for the spike protein and put it in the, uh, in the uh, lipid encapsulated uh, particle. Uh, so platforms are becoming extremely important and we should really focus on that. Uh, over to you, Dr. Felix. Yeah, uh, so I think we can conclude the session because it's already too late. And thank you so much, sir. You have already spent so much time. Uh, we started the session basically at 10.45. You came in time and we tested out. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing, it's absolutely fabulous talk that you've made. Lots of inspiring words. I, I'm definitely going to watch the entire video once again. It's a, it's a full of wisdom. And it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's like a creative spark or inspiration. So on behalf of Central University of Punjab and academies, uh, thank you so much for being part of us and spending good time with us. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank Yavich. you, Felix. Thank you for inviting uh, sir, me. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing you guys are doing. Uh, keep, keep doing it every year. This is very, very, very important. Thank you so much, sir. Like, uh, as sir said, it was like a sparkling presentation, which has ignited a lot of uh, spark within us. And I, I actually like, it is not essential to become a science leader, but it is your responsibility to develop a science leader. That is actually, uh, I, uh, I actually adore that. Thank you so much, sir. Once again, thank, thank you so much for sparing your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So our next talk is at one o'clock. So please join back uh, one o'clock for Dr. Smita Jain's talk. Uh, she is actually the founder and chief executive officer of India Bioscience Wing of the NCBS uh, Bangalore. So uh, she's a very well-known science communicator. It's in Young Science Leaders Program. It's starting at one o'clock. So please join back till then. Goodbye.